welcome to to everyone to our latest um, Power Up Your Sales webinar. We have this monthly, and uh, the main aim is to empower um, the, the real estate industry with uh, skills so that they can make more money, that they can be more successful, they can be more efficient. And I'm very excited that we've got this month's, uh, this month's webinar called Making Money from Rental Procurements. Now, I will introduce um, our speaker in a minute. But uh, just briefly, I'm David Beatty. Uh, my business is Chorus Property Group. We manage rentals and sexual title management schemes across Cape Town and Johannesburg uh, under our Chorus Property Group brand. Um, so we've, we've got about 20, 20 plus years experience of that. We've managed thousands of units. At the moment, we've got about 1,100 units under management. So hopefully um, we have some kind of expertise to share uh, today with everyone. And then we we are building, rapidly building our sales team under Chorus Property Group, powered by EXP. And uh, we've got sales team members all across the country, Creel, Vidbank, um, Michalisburg, Sasselburg, um, yeah, where else? Um, Soweto, Johannesburg, all around Cape Town, uh, Durban, etc. So yeah, welcome to everyone. Um, oh yeah, by the way, I also did write the book, The Expert Landlord. And uh, whoever lasts until the end, I'm going to do a random draw and I will send you a copy of this book free of charge. But in the meantime, you can get this book at exclusive books, um, take a lot, etc. I make very little money from it. Um, I don't, um, but I think it is a very useful A to Z of how to manage a property. Um, so yeah, have a use of it and hopefully um, we can get some expertise around that today as well. So um, I just want to welcome Sean Late. I'm really excited and privileged, and um, we should be privileged to have Sean uh, being our uh, presenter today. Sean, um, just to go through his bio, um, he actually started his career in real estate in New Zealand, of all places, um, in late 2000. He originally focused on sales, but then was drawn into um, tenanting for a property investing company in around 2005. And what should have been a, like a, a temporary gig for him ended up being something permanent. And uh, he's actually set up the rentals division for that company. Um, and in, over since then, he's actually worked at the coalface on rentals, tenanting, tenant management, et cetera. And uh, he eventually, um, back in South Africa, became a partner in the business, unless that was New Zealand. doesn't matter. Either way. It was New Zealand. Um, and um, he was also a rentals operations manager for a well-known brand uh, in South Africa. And uh, in recent terms, in the last two or three years, was it maybe three or four years, he's been focusing on rental management training as a full-time gig. So why I'm excited to, to have Sean um, uh, presenting to us today is for three main reasons. First of all, he's got incredible experience of being actually at the coalface. Second of all, uh, of rentals and rentals management. So he's not talking theory. Second of all, he's had lots and lots of experience of actually training us as estate agents. So actual rental agent training, which I think gives, us, gives him another insight. And thirdly, Sean as a person is incredibly detailed, very practical, and uh, he's, he's not into theory, he's not into hype. Um, and what we're going to get is real practical, tangible takeaways today as to how to do a rental procurement, not only productively, but also we need to protect our interests uh, uh, because there's, there's risk involved and legal risk and those kind of things. Both our risk, uh, we need to protect ourselves and uh, protect the landlord and of course the tenant as well. So uh, welcome, Sean. Um, you can take it from here, um, but I'm very excited that and privileged that you have to, um, set aside some time uh, to train us today. Thank you, so go ahead. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I'm on it um, to have been invited. Before I get going, can I just ask anything? Is there any traffic noise in the background that you can that anybody can hear? Fantastic. Okay, okay. I've got the windows open because it's a nice day in Cape Town. Um, but then it, I happen to live on a main road. But it's bothering me. It doesn't bother you. That's perfectly fine. I don't want to um, spoil your experience. David, I'm going to share my screen if I may. Go for it. Okie dokie. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Dave has asked me to talk about adding essentially the, the rental procurement offering to your boutique of services, your, your, your basket of services you offer. 
um, why one would do that, you know, what's involved in doing that, that sort of thing. What I do want to say, though, first off, is I'm going to be very much guided by you guys in terms of where we go with this presentation. I have a guideline. I have a plan to cover a lot of stuff. I'm not in too much detail, practicalities, but if anywhere along the line you have any questions, please don't hesitate to pop them in the chat. Um, if I know people are sometimes shy to ask questions, if you're too shy to ask a question publicly, you can send a direct message to me and I won't name you. So um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I'm here to answer your questions, help you make more money and um, make sure that we, we resolve any issues. Firstly, just to get an idea of where we're at and who is in the audience. Are you currently offering rental procurement services to landlords or not? If you are, could you just pop a one in the chat, the digit one? And if you're not, can you pop a number two in the chat um, so that I can get an idea? Um, and David, if you don't mind, sorry, I'm taking a liberty here. If you don't mind that we can just sort of get an idea. Um, I'm going to carry on talking about my intro quickly, but then we can just get an idea of where the audience is at, if people are, are new to this or if people are already entrenched in this. Okay, so as David said, my name is Sean Late, and there's all the history that he told you about. Um, I've been involved in various degrees in rentals. I started off with tenanting for an investment company, which was supposed to be a two-month gig. Um, I thought I'd get bored of it. I seem to enjoy it. I'm a bit odd. Um, and then I realized because I like systems, systems work well in rentals. And I then ended up setting up a rental division, being a rental operations manager, a business partner, et cetera. Came back to South Africa. And eventually after a, a gig, a stint as a rental operations manager, um, decided to go into training. So my focus at the moment is empowering uh -huh. a with knowledge sorry oh i thought you said something sorry no, no, um, that's right every now and again i'll meet some i will meet someone okay okay no problem um so so it's to empower agents with the knowledge i also have developed process documentation for various rental processes um which is like checklists with communication templates etc to help people make their lives easier our website is rental sphere where rental agents feel comfortable or are empowered, dot COSA. Um, and if you go to our, our website, I'll just fit this in quickly, you will see that there is some on-demand training, and then we also have regular um, live training. So the, the, the website is simply rentalsphere.coza, um, and you're welcome to join our mailing list. Um, you just go to rentalsphere.coza front slash join, um, and it's easy and simple to do. So that, I think, is enough about me. Uh, let me just get back to my presentation. There we are. So now let's start getting into some nitty gritty about what is rental procurement. I just want to get an idea. Okay, it seems like we have quite a few people who are doing procurements. And then we have some who have not yet done. So I'm going I'm going to jump around a bit of, between basics and a little more advanced. And as I say, if you have any questions at any point in time, please feel free to pop them in the chat. So let's start off by all getting on the same page about what do we mean when we talk about a rental procurement. Um, I used to market it as find me a tenant service. That's really what it is. An owner of a property will come to you or come to an agent because they want somebody to find them a tenant. And finding a tenant means that marketing to try and source somebody who wants to rent the property. But then the other very important point of vetting, okay, vetting tenants for a landlord. And eventually that process will then end up in, the, in, in that property that is now got a lease agreement, that tenancy, that lease being handed over to somebody else to manage on a continuous basis. So it's it, it it's a procurement, it's a it's it's also called placement um, or find me a tenant. So it, it's that it's that part about getting a tenant into a property. That's really what it's about. And then you would hand over either to most probably in most cases the landlord to continue to manage it. So you're only involved in the first play uh, in the beginning. Um, or sometimes you might even hand over to a managing agent. I don't know. 
I'm, I'm going to give you another option at the end of this presentation where you might want to then outsource the management so it doesn't go to another to another competitive agent um, if that's something that's going to work for you. Everything has to do with what's going to work for you and what's not. This morning when I was, I'd already finished my presentation and, and then I thought to myself as I was lying in bed last night, so I just up, updated this, the question about the why. Why on earth would somebody who is focusing on sales and large amounts of money want to get involved in procurement? And there's probably, I think, two reasons. And please add any other reasons why you're doing it. But one would be cash flow. We all know that in sales, you get large amounts of money, but the cash flow doesn't always flow when it needs to flow. So one thing is to sort of flatten out your cash flow curve. Have, have consistent amounts coming in. And because it's a procurement, it's a once-off payment of a reasonably significant figure, depending on where in the country you are, um, a reasonably significant figure that can help cash flow incredibly. But there's another, there's another benefit to this. One of the biggest issues I know that sales consultants have is building a database, banking future business, and by attracting clients who have rental properties, by offering them the tenant, the find me a tenant, the tenant procurement service, you can actually broaden your database. So your, 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 your pool of potential sellers for future business. You know, you, you, if one looks at landlords, they are often the more difficult people to find because they don't live in the area. So they're not always easy to contact or to get into touch with by normal um, lead generation processes. But by offering a procurement service, you are attracting those people because they will be looking in that specific area for somebody that can help them find a tenant if that's the job they want done and they don't want to, to deal with the management side. So what is, what is, and this is just to get some of the more basic details out of the way. What is involved in this service offering um, or what is generally involved? I have to say before we get into this and before I give you some examples, there are no hard and fast rules. There are no hard and fast rules. Different landlords may want different services. Different agents may want to offer different service offerings. But let's talk about what is traditionally in inverted commas referred to as a procurement service. So the very first step would be taking the property to market, advertising it for rent, dealing with a lot of inquiries, normally a lot of inquiries. And this is the, the numbers. The numbers, rentals is a bit more about volumes. Those of you that are already involved in it will know this already. There's more volume involved. But with a procurement, your turnaround time to, to turn effort into cash should be shorter with all the necessary skills. Then we get to the point of arranging and, and showing the properties to prospective tenants. Something that comes in here that, that has become more and more important these days is the pre-screening. The reality is when you, you can't just jump in your car and go show properties to people. The other thing is people don't always understand this affordability issue. Now, affordability is something we're going to talk about. Can the tenant comfortably afford the property? So most agents these days, or most rental agents these days, will do some form of pre-screening, where you will ask at least questions like, is your growth or is your net combined income three times what the property rental is, for example? Um, I suggest that people go a little bit further than that. Security, where we live, security is an issue. And normally you have a lone person meeting an unknown person in a vacant property. Um, but you guys, you guys do viewings on the sales side. Um, but what we would normally do is there is a way to do a pre-screening, and we're going to talk about that. I'm going to show you some of the tools that are available to do these sorts of things beforehand where you can find out if this person is a real person. Um, rentals is, is often in the news for scams. 
So we have to be careful of those sorts of weird things. But I'm going to give you some tips as we go through. So we're marketing the property. We're dealing with the inquiries. We're arranging and doing the viewings. We then have this other step, this other step where we send out an application form um, and we get the application form back with all of the information we need to do a vetting. We can only check information that we get. So we have quite a thorough application form, quite a lot of personal information. This might be different to the sales job that you do because we aren't shy about asking for personal information. To be honest, we insist on it because we cannot vet a client. We cannot do a thorough screening. We cannot work in the best interests of our landlord to protect our landlord and ourselves, which we're also going to talk about, um, if we do not get the right information. You may sometimes have to deal with situations where, since Poppia, this is a new thing. I can't give you that because of Poppia. Um, if you if you get those sorts of questions, let me know. I'm more than happy um, to to help you out with some ways of dealing with that. Then we check the info. We cannot in we cannot where we live. And it's not actually only where we live. It's in modern times. You cannot accept what you get on paper. You cannot, and we'll talk about fraudulent documents. I, I had a, a particular info session last year about that because I was getting so many of the rental agents calling me and saying, Sean, look at this. Look at this. I've got this. It was fraudulent. And I was like, how on earth do you even know it's fraudulent? Uh, and then they'd explain to me, and I think, oh, my goodness, this is happening far too much. So we need to check the info, including, of course, the FICA. Now, this is the other thing on the rental side. We FICA our landlords, and then, of course, we FICA our prospective tenants before we can enter into a lease agreement for them. Then we get into more personal information where we check their credit history and their other references. Now, my no, we'll get into this a little bit further. Um, there is a way that you can outsource that. That is, you know, vetting applicants, vetting applicants is one of the most critical steps that are one of the one of the biggest responsibilities of somebody who's involved in rentals whether you're involved in procurement or not um so that's something that if you want to you can outsource that particular task and i'll talk about some options there then we negotiate or we conclude or we draw up or we get the lease agreement executed which is then the guiding document for the duration of the lease then, ladies and gentlemen, an ingoing inspection, a pre, a, a pre ingoing inspection, I suppose you could call it, needs to be done. A state of the property report. Um, because, of course, this is a long term relationship and you can have damages that happen. So, normally, an ingoing inspection is also done. And this is a requirement under legislation. So, that's not optional. What is optional? And the reason for the question marks there is whether you offer that as part of your procurement service or not. I think the norm would be that most agents would include that in a procurement service, but not everybody necessarily does. Um, but we'll talk about that as we go through as well. And then you get the property handover. I've always said that for a procurement, Mr. and Mrs. Landlord, you've asked me to do the vetting, I'm, I will do the ingoing inspection for you, but I'm only providing you with a report. I don't get involved in more than that because after all, you are paying me for a limited service. But when it comes to property handover, where possible, that is your responsibility, Mr. and Mrs. Landlord, because that's where you meet your tenant, possibly for the first time. That's where you hand the keys over. That's where you talk to the tenant about any snags. And that's where your responsibility takes over. But there isn't, there isn't a, a sharp line um, between where procurement ends and where management starts. Some people include an outgoing inspection. I never include an outgoing inspection in a procurement service um, for an, a number of reasons. I will do the ingoing inspection, but these days with the requirements that people want professional inspection reports, et cetera, um, it may not be something that as a sales agent only doing procurement, you may want to invest in, but that's totally, totally up to you. Um, so let's have a look at a typical mandate example. Now, I did have this ready. Uh, there, there we are. Um, 
a typical mandate example to give you an idea of what a mandate would normally say. Um, and we just, we're going to go over this very, very briefly. Um, I did highlight some areas uh, that I just want to cover. So for those of you that may or may not yet be into procurement, uh, or into doing rentals or have started doing rentals, one of the easiest ways to get the documentation is to purchase, or your office may have already have this, or your brand may already have this, is the TPN lease pack. The TPN lease pack is one of the most commonly used um, packs in South Africa with a lot of standard documentation, including including um, the, the mandate. So just to get some ideas, in terms of income, you will see there's a procurement commission, which we'll go into a little bit more detail, but you can see that there's also, if the, if the lease is renewed, there is the potential to get a second year and following years procurement commission if the lease longer than lease extends, lasts longer than the initial 12 months so that you have concluded. Generally, landlords will want an initial 12 month period. Um, but I always say generally, or there's no there's no such thing as a rule in this business, as you probably all know. Um, but there is the potential for follow-up commissions for following years. But that's not the part I want to focus on now. I want to talk about the procurement, man the general, the general procurement mandate responsibilities. Let me just get there. So in terms of the procurement, it would normally be, this is your contract, obviously, with the owner. You know, you know these things. The property practitioner is tasked with finding a suitable tenant, okay, to lease the premises. And our responsibilities would generally be advertising, marketing, and otherwise exposing the premises to potential tenants, getting the message out there, throwing your net as, you know, casting your net as wide as possible. That's really what it comes down to. Then arranging viewings by making arrangements with whoever lives in the property. Um, this is sometimes a bit problematic, but there's ways to make it, it can be time consuming, but there's ways to make it easier. Then our other responsibility is to perform all vetting, including credit, employment, and other reference checks, and ensuring that the tenant can afford the rental. And we'll talk about what the guidelines are, what the generally accepted practices are there. And then ensuring that any specific requirements in relation to a potential tenant are met. Now, that specific inquiry requirements of a landlord can be a bit tricky and one has to be cautious. The Rental Housing Act has, has very specific anti-discriminatory clauses in it. So often when landlords will give us their preferences, their preferences may not fall within the ambit of the law and we might have to do some landlord education. Um, but, but those are the generally accepted, as you will see from, from the general mandate. If anybody has any questions, as I said, at any point in time, something you want to ask, please feel free to do it. So that would be a typical mandate. That is what we are offering, and that's what we're undertaking um, to, to do for the landlord and on behalf of the landlord, and then to hand the property normally, normally back to the landlord. Now the question is, that, that's the responsibilities, but what is the value offering that we are offering the client? Why would a client pay a reasonably large amount of money, okay, to us for the purposes of finding and vetting a tenant? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are offering them, and they don't always realize this, and this is part of our pitch, we are offering them peace of mind and a huge amount of protection that they maybe can't achieve on their own, but probably don't know how to achieve on their own, probably don't even understand the risks. So that is a huge value offering, okay? Um, there's a lot of time that goes into the marketing, the dealing with the inquiries, the viewings. There can be quite a lot of time and traveling that goes into that. The other big thing that we are offering them, and I find that private landlords, who's, who are normally the ones that will ask for a procurement service, often don't understand the importance of this. And when we do our pitch, this is part of what we need to talk to them about. We deal with this every day. 
This is our business. This is our expertise. And we deal with this on a business level. When we are vetting somebody, when we are screening somebody, we are doing it without fear or favor. A private landlord, unless they are the sort of landlord that David was talking about in the beginning, who has a larger portfolio and, and is an expert at this, will often deal with this on a on a on a a more personal sort of level if they like the people. And it, it's difficult. It's difficult to understand. It's difficult for them. Because if you like the people, then you sort of want to rent to them. But that's the wrong basis for, for, for doing this decision. We need to check that they are going to be the lowest risk people, the best fit for this rental property. Um, and that's where we have a totally, totally different approach to what a private landlord often does. I, I deal with a number of inquiries, sometimes from private landlords, not always from private landlords. But more often than not, we will find that things go awry when, when, when somebody has got sidetracked by the I like them sort of thing. I like them. I want to help them. Um, so, so that's something that, that, that happens easily when you're doing this. And even if you're doing it for yourself, even if you're an agent, you're doing it for yourself. You, it's so easy to get caught up in this. Then, of course, we have the no fear or favor screen and or our tenant vetting. One of the huge things that I don't think we often share with our landlords, how important this is and, and what benefit they're getting from this, is the fact that we are obliged under the FICA legislation to know our client, to, to, to identify them, to verify their identification. And we'll talk about how you do that, to verify their identification to know that they are, we, we confirm the identification with home affairs. You know, that's one of the things I'd say when I'm pitching to clients is, you know, if they say, but why must I pay you that amount of money? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Landlord, the reality is you're going to advertise the property. People off the street in inverted commas are going to come in and, and inquire and you're going to meet with them. Uh, firstly, there's a security issue there. But do you actually know that those people are who they say they are? Because the reality is you cannot go on an ID copy anymore. And, 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 and I've seen fake IDs. We had a situation last year with a client of mine who had gotten, they'd viewed the property. Um, they, they hadn't done a pre-screening. I think they do pre-screen now. Uh, they hadn't done a pre-screening. They viewed the property. They put in an application. Um, the administrator who does who does the, the tenant vetting there started having a look through the, the vetting process. And when they did the credit check um, with, with TPN, it came back to say that the, the, the ID number doesn't exist at Home Affairs. Now, sometimes you get, we get these system problems, Home Affairs is down or whatever. Fortunately, this agent pushed the matter a bit further and she Googled this man. Um, because what he did, what he did was his FICA documentation. Shame. Sometimes people are fortunately not that clever. Um, what he did was he handed in his proof of residential address was a levy stage with a property address. So she then asked him if he owns a property, and he said no. Now, part of the reason I give you these stories is these are the stories you can tell to landlords. Make them your own. This is how we make landlords a little bit nervous about being, that, that's always my first goal to get a procurement. I want to make them a little bit nervous about doing it themselves. So in any case, so she had the levy statement. She asked him if he owned a property. He said no, and she was like, mm, but she's got a levy statement. Anyhow, she then went and Googled him and found out that he had been, um, what's the word, bankrupted? Or um, no, there's a better word for it. Anyhow. Um, he'd had a wind-up of his, of his affairs. And it turned out that the ID that he was using wasn't the same ID on the winding up of his affairs. He had a duplicate ID. And it looked like a real ID. So these are the sorts of things. So one of the biggest, one of the, one of the biggest pains in our butt, Fika, it can be one of your biggest selling points. Mr. and Mrs. Landlord, I am obliged to confirm that this person is who they say they are with the Department of Home Affairs. That's part of the service I offer. And to me, that is huge when we are dealing with a place where, where fraudulent documents are, are simply rife and scams are all over the place. Then, of course, there's further tenant screening that we do. We confirm the employment, Mr. and Mrs. Landlord. 
Um, we we look at their bank account. We confirm that everything is for real. We we call their employer. We confirm that they're working there. We don't take pay slips because we've had too many examples of pay slips that don't tally. Um, one one of the more common things you'll find when you're dealing with applications is possibly, possibly, because I found that the, this rearing its ugly head where we ask for a bank statement. And I know a lot of people feel uncomfortable doing that. Ladies and gentlemen, all you need is one, one bad experience and, and you'll get over your discomfort, I promise you. Um, but we ask for bank statements. And I've, I've seen many comments in, in some of these tenancy groups and these rental groups and legal talk and places like that where people would say, I'm not giving my bank statement. Under Poppia, I don't have to. No, Mr. and Mrs. P potential tenant. Poppia doesn't say that you can... It's, well, you can always refuse, but then I can also refuse because I haven't got the information to do that, to, to offer the service to you. Um, but the reality is it's the Protection of Personal Information Act, not the Refusal of Personal Information Act. I can ask for what I need. And 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 with today, you have to have two things to 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 check against. So I need a pay slip, for example, if somebody's not self-employed, and I then need to go and check that amount against the bank account. Um, part, part of the examples, or some of the examples that we dealt with when we looked at fraudulent documents, was on the fact that pay slips get doctored, um, and then people. <laughs> People forget certain things and they they doctor the pay slip, but then the amount that's net doesn't correspond to the amount of the bank statement. But if you don't have the bank statement, you won't get that. You won't pick that up. So it's that sort of that sort of uh, investigation that one then does. Um, but I, I do have a full complete training on that um, where we go through a checklist. We have communication templates, all sorts of things. Let me not get too involved in the detail. Then another major advantage of your service, a major value to the client is getting a professional lease agreement. We offer them a professional, a, a, you know, a, a generally accepted lease agreement that has been prepared by lawyers. If they go to a lawyer and ask for this, it, it's going to cost them a, a considerable amount of money. Lawyers don't do lease agreements cheaply. Um, point number one. Point number two, the other, op the other option is to go to CNA or somewhere like that. And I actually had a friend of mine um, who was asked us to find a tenant and then she found one herself and let me know, don't worry. And I was like, oh, okay, so do you need help with the lease agreement? She said, no, 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 no. Um, it's fine. I bought one at CNA. So I went to go and have a look at what this lease agreement looks like at CNA. It's a two-pager and it still asks for stamp duty on it because she said to me, no, she's just waiting for them to pay the stamp duty. And I was like, huh? Stamp duty, I haven't heard about that word for a long time. We don't do that anymore. Um, and she was like, oh, okay, no, but you must just pay the stamp duty. And I went to go and have a look at it. it, it I don't even think it was CPA compliant. Um, so those are the, you know, if Orlando says they're going to go to CNA, we must talk to them about the CPA. So you sort of adapt your pitch as you're talking about that. Then the professional in going inspection. Mr. and Mrs. Landlord. When you get to the end of the lease and there's something that you believe is damaged, if you want to claim that, the Rental Housing Act says you've got to be able to prove that that was damage done during the course of the occupation of the tenant, Mr. and Mrs. Landlord, which means we need a before and an after photo. A before and an after photo. It's like when people, you know, Let's take Weight Watchers as an example. A Weight Watchers ad, they've got a before photo and an after photo. If they don't have a before photo, they only have an after photo. You ain't going to be selling Weight Watchers, are you? Or the other way around. Exactly the same. If we do not have a before and an after picture, a state of the property report, it's, it's not a defects list anymore. The, the legislation still says defects list. But if you go to the tribunal, they don't ask you for a defects list. They say, show me a picture of that at the beginning. That's what happens. I've lost at the tribunal because of that. So a professional in going inspection, landlords don't have the tools available to do these professional in going inspections. So, so, so there's a lot of value. And then, of course, we hand over to the landlord, to the managing agent. So to me, the biggest, the biggest selling points for our service, the biggest value, the biggest piece of mind and protection 
that we are offering the, the, the landlord is in this tenant vetting where we, at the very least, at the very least, because of FICA, confirm that the person is who they say they are because we confirm with home offense. That is, in my mind, huge, huge when you when you hear about the number of scams and, and you know, we hear, sorry, I'm thinking of something now again, Tabo Besta. I mean, we, we all, I think we all know who Tabo Besta now is. Tabo Besta was renting a 75,000 rand a month house somewhere in, in some other suburb in Joburg. But then it turned out the man doesn't even exist at home affairs. That's the sort of situation that we are preventing by, co by confirming with home affairs. That's a, that's a good one to explain to them. And then, of course, the lease agreement and this ingoing inspection. That ingoing inspection has, has a value that I can't put a number on because we don't know at the end. We, we can vet as much as we want, but we cannot predict the future. We don't know what is going to happen at that property. And damages can turn out to be expensive. They don't always happen. P but part of my job, Mr. and Mrs. Landlord, and I'm, I'm talking now as if I'm pitching, part of my job, Mr. and Mrs. Landlord, is to help protect you when something goes wrong. If it doesn't go wrong, that's fantastic. But if it does, you are going to thank your lucky stars you used us and we got everything tied up in a decent lease agreement, and we've given you a very good state of the property report at the start of the lease, because you can then claim. If you don't have one of these inspections in or out, you can't claim. Ladies and gentlemen, am I making sense? David, any, any, any thoughts at the moment? Then Anything one, you want to add to something I've said? I mean, there's a couple of practical questions, um, but um, let's let you, you just keep going from my side at least, and maybe there's are, are some questions from uh, from from our uh, from our viewers. Okay. In, uh, in, in, in your in your experience, do you you guys would? I'm I'm assuming in a, in in in, a, in I shouldn't I shouldn't assume that it's a stupid thing to do. Um, I'm I'm assuming that you would in, include generally an ingoing inspection as part of a procurement service. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's the that in my view that's one of the the big risk factors that many le uh, le uh, leasing agents do not do. Mm -hmm. uh, I just find, especially in Joburg, is that um, you don't do the mid mid uh, the ingoing inspection. I mean, even when I rented in Joburg, a nice house in the northern suburbs of Joburg, the agent basically just handed over keys, and um, and quite frankly, the landlord has no right uh, was no um, rights at the at the outgoing inspection. If the, and there wasn't an outgoing inspection mm -hmm. uh, to um, you know to, to then recover damages from, from tenants. So yeah, you've got to make yeah. sure it's done. Yeah, and I think that's that's a huge part of the value offering. When we are pitching our services to somebody, why would you use me? Why would you pay me the amount of money that I'm I'm asking to do this? Because Mr. And Mrs. Landlord, over the course of this 12 month lease, life happens. Life happens, and it's not it doesn't necessarily happen on purpose. Things happen by accident, but those things that happen can cost you a fortune, can cost you a fortune. So because of that, we need to protect you. Um, the, the rental housing, I just, just not to go into detail, but just, just to explain you know, the, the principles of the Rental Housing Act. An ingoing inspection, state of the property report. I like to call it a state of the property report. A state of the property report has to be done before the tenant moves in. Then a state of the property report needs to be done at the end of the lease. Then the damaged deposit has a very, very limited use for it's specified what the damaged deposit can be applied for, what can be what it can be used for at the end of the lease. One of those things is damages. Okay. It's, it's not necessarily a common thing, but it can be an expensive thing. So one of those things is damages. But the rental housing access very, very clearly. If there is no ingoing inspection done, joint, joint. No joint ingoing inspection done with the tenant or no joint outgoing inspection done. If either of those is missing, the landlord has no claim. Now, ladies and gentlemen, private landlords do not have the technology, do not have the wherewithal, do not have the skill to do these sorts of inspections, do not have the tools to do these sorts of inspections. And that can cost them dearly. To be honest, they're normally a bit more laid back and less affair, um, and they don't do that. Because everybody's everybody's most friendly at the beginning of the lease. It's at the end of the lease that we have these issues. So that is a huge value add, a huge, huge value add.
Okie dokie. Now, what Hi, is... Sean. Yes. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, how do you... You know, some cases you have um, a tenant who's leaving at the end of the month. Hmm. And then someone wants to move in at the beginning on the first of the month. Yes. So because the service we offer with David is we do do the move in and the move out inspections. So sometimes you might have a challenge with a tenant saying, okay, I need to do the move out. Uh, let's just say the month ends on the 31st. They only want it done on the 31st, but you still have to do the move in and it's it ends up becoming, you know, the schedule conflicts and a one bit of the reasons. So, sorry, who am I talking to? Uh, Lebo. Lebo, one of the reasons I, and, and sorry, David, I don't want to step on your toes here by accident. Um, one of the reasons I don't generally get involved in the outgoing inspections for a procurement, okay, for a procurement, is because okay. of the reason that. If I do do that, let's say it's a recurring client, then I may do the outgoing inspection for them, but I would only do the report and they would deal with the rest of it. Um, in terms of, the, you know, because they're the ones that have dealt with the maintenance, they're the ones that have had the communication with the tenant over the 12-month period. I don't, I, don't, I don't have the information to be able to make a judgment call. So I would just do the report for them if this was a procurement because the end of inspection report can then be used for the ingoing inspection for the next tenant, which are potentially procured, in which case I'd, I'd add that in as let's call it a bonus. But let's talk about the end of month. I, I, do, have, I do have training on this where I have an exit, an exit process, um, but this would normally be for managed leases. But what would normally happen is it's very important. I, I've ended up in the, the, the small claims court because of a, um, because of not doing this. And this is when I started doing this. The, the lease ends on the last day of the month. The new lease starts on the first day of the month. So we do the exit inspection with the tenant on the last day of the month. Then if there is anything wrong, if there is anything wrong, the problem is you now have the stress that you have to get it right by the next day. When I'm managing a property, I always suggest to people to do a pre-exit inspection because that makes a huge difference because then you have an idea of what you are potentially going to find. At the end, you have the opportunity to do this. is about three weeks before the end of the lease. You have the opportunity to talk to the tenant about it. You have the opportunity of explaining to them that they now have the opportunity to fix this. But at the exit inspection, when I'm coming in and I'm doing my exit inspection, this is when I'm doing the final state of the property report. Anything that is noted then, the landlord has the right, under the legislation, has the right to fix and, to sorry, to repair and to deduct the cost, the reasonable costs, the law says, of those repairs from the outgoing, in, uh, of, uh, sorry, from the deposit. Um, so it, it, it's very important that we stick to that lease ends on the first of the month, lease starts, uh, sorry, lease ends on the last day of the month, lease starts on the first of the month, so that one then has the opportunity. But a, a big, big, big changing factor here is if you do do a pre-inspection. So if, if, if you were going to be involved with an outgoing inspection, I would probably suggest to the landlord that they pay me to do a pre-inspection so that we can we can we can have an idea of where things are going, what it's looking like, um, and 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 advise the tenant accordingly to try and get the property because normally you would get the property back in a in a better state than what you would have got otherwise. Does does that answer you? Does that give you some ideas, level? No, yes, it does. Because yeah, we we're not strictly procurement, so it's oh, okay. holistic of manage. Yeah, so okay, I I'm do. with you. So level is talking about um yeah from a chorus perspective doing a managerial. Yes. And um, yeah. um, obviously, level we can definitely talk to our operations team as to what the experience is. But I think what I've learned is to be quite strict with the move out tenant. Uh, the tenant moving out, uh, they want to move out in the morning of the first. No, you, you have to be out by the end of that prop, uh, end of the thirty first. Yes. Um, and what we often say is our lease agreement, at least in the past, it says you need to be out by the by twelve o'clock on the last yeah. day of the month. And um, so you need to you need to be quite strict with that. Um, and then you're communicating clearly to the new tenant moving in that these items will be um, sorted. And it's noted on the move-in inspection that these items um, will be sorted and not the responsibility of the tenant moving in. 
So I think just clear communication and then also asking for patience among all the parties, especially the moving in tenants, that logistically um, we all need to work together on this thing. And then the maintenance team or the agent needs to be quite clear in communicating their expectations and in getting the job done. It's one of the things in rentals is that we need to be firm. We need to be firm. Not, not rude or anything, but we're firm. You sign, you know, it, 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 it sort of doesn't make sense to me that an adult is signing a contract where they know that the terms of the contract, or they should know, and it's been explained to them that the contract starts at 12 noon on the, the first day of the month, and it ends at 12 noon on the last day of the month, of whatever the month is, okay, when they end. And that happens to be the contractual ar arrangement. So that is what can be expected of them. I had a situation this month, for example, not me, um, one of my clients had a situation um, where the tenants moved out at the night time of something about in the night of the last day of the month, but the agent allowed it. The agent arranged the in, the outgoing inspection for the morning of the first, okay? But clearly they didn't communicate with their landlord because then the landlord instructed the agent to charge the tenant for the first for an extra day because they were supposed to have been out on the night. And the agent, the agent's argument, I wasn't dealing with that particular agent, but the agent's argument was, no, no, it says that they end on the 31st, they can stay until midnight. I, I don't know where people get these funny ideas from because the contractual relationship is until 12 noon, if that's what your lease says. And I suggest you do that. I, I We used to let them stay over because everybody was worried where people were going to sleep. But we need, we need, to, worry, we need to think about where our responsibility is. And our responsibility is to facilitate our landlord's transaction and to protect our landlord. Um, the, 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 the case where I ended up in the small claims court was exactly because of the fact that I let them stay. And then there was a move out and a move in happening at the same time. And it was impossible for the, the, the um, rental agent to do a proper outgoing inspection. And the property was filthy. The man had it even packed yet. And so we charged him for cleaning and he took us to the small claims court because he wasn't happy. And, and, and the adjudicator at the small claims court was the person that said to me, Mr. Late, why do you make your life so difficult? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, why are you letting people stay until this, you, you're doing in and out on the same day? You, you, you're, you're going to run into trouble. And I said, but where are they going to stay? And he said, but that's not your problem. Don't make that your problem. And that's when I decided, you know, all you need is a bad experience. And then you, you learn to be a little bit firmer. Um, and, and we very much do have to take control. So hopefully that gives some ideas there. Okay. So what is the going rate? Normally procurement is calculated or the, the procurement commission is calculated a, as a percentage of the contract value. So let's take an example. If you are concluding a 12 month lease at 10,000 Rand a month of it, you know, 10,000 Rand a month rental and a 12 month lease, then your contract value is 120,000 Rand over that 12 month value. Okay. Um, and I believe the, the, the generally accepted practice is 8% XVAT of the contract value, which is about 9,600. Um, and that is payable on completion of the service. And it's usually paid out for those that, that haven't done this yet, usually paid out of the initial rental. The first, it's a bit more than one month's rental. So, so often the arrangement will be that the tenant pay the first two months rental to us if it's more than one month's rental. A lot of people, a lot of people, it seems that a lot of people have decided to, to cap that at one month's rental, including that. And that is for a practical reason, which means essentially that the first month's rental gets paid to us, we then hand over to the landlord because that gets paid to us, of course, more, as soon as we've concluded the lease agreement and done all of our all of our service offering, we've completed. Um, and we will then hand over to the landlord. So a lot of people kept that at one month, including that. Um, that's a practical matter because then the first month's rental and the deposit is paid to us. We transfer the deposit to the landlord, um, and we then take our commission. Well, well, our commission is the whole of the first month's rental. So that's that's often a practical one. Now there is potential of ongoing. 
if one has a look at this typical mandate, I pointed this out earlier. And that is that a general procurement mandate talks about a second year's procurement commission and an additional year's procurement commission. So you are doing the procurement and it will normally be a lower percentage. Okay, it would normally be a lower percentage. And if one goes and has a look at the mandate, sorry, I just want to get to the part. Uh, okay, so firstly, the procurement commission is normally payable to the by the landlord on the signature of the lease agreement. Okay, so we're talking about money that comes in a reasonably short span of time compared to sales. A reasonably short span of time. You're listing it you're tenanting it, you're concluding the lease agreement, you get paid. You get paid about a month's rent. Right? Let's just say roughly a month's rent. But there could be, it says it says here, it's specifically recorded, and you, you need to look at your mandate and see if this is in your mandate or not. It's specifically recorded that regardless of whether the property practitioner operates under a procurement mandate or a management mandate, should the tenant renew the lease agreement or conclude a further lease agreement after the termination or cancellation of the lease agreement with or without the assistance of the property practitioner, then the property practitioner will be regarded as the effective clause, a cause, and the property practitioner will be entitled to payment. So that would that would normally be something like a 4%. What I would normally do is I would normally diarize to follow up with my landlord and offer them a renewal on, on a professional lease agreement format um, and then charge that procurement commission because the value of that lease agreement, the, 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 the document I'm giving them, is probably close to the, the, the uh, amount that I'm charging for those additional years. So, so people would normally, let's say, charge an 8% on a first, on a first year, Four percent, and then additional uh, additional renewals could be another administrative fee. So the, it's not only necessarily a one-off. If you can diarize to to follow up on renewals and things like that, you can make potential annual income. And if you have one of these or two of these a month, it takes a lot of pressure um, off the cash flow situation. Now there is, I'll ta I'll talk at the end about the outsource management. Now, of course, the other potential commission you can get is the sales commission. Because if somebody's dealing with you and they know they're doing sales, this can be a huge upsell. This can be a huge benefit for you. Because remember, we're talking about people who generally, they have a rental property or property that needs to be rented, that didn't necessarily buy it as a rental property, in your area. But they are not living in your area anymore because the property is rented out. They might be living somewhere totally else, as some, some other place. You know, it might be far away, it may not be far away, but they are not up to date with things in your area. Who's their contact in your area? You, you, their friend in real estate, their mate in real estate, you're their mate in real estate. So they, they, you have a good chance of getting the sale on that on that that property when they get when we get to that point. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk a little bit about protecting yourself. This is important in the rental management. There is a specific clause, and this is critical. Oh, what, where am I now? What do I do with my mandate? Oh, there we are. My apologies, I get a bit confused. I just want to go to the procurement part. There we are. This is important. We need to protect ourselves. We are doing credit checks. We are doing all of those things. We've undertaken to do that. This mandate says very clearly, in the event that the tenant has been correctly screened and placed by the property practitioner in terms of this mandate agreement, in other words, we've done what we've undertaken to do, then we, the property practitioner, either the company and or the, the, the agent, cannot be held liable to the landlord for any loss or damages, including the tenant not paying the rental or vacating the premises before the lease agreement expires. This is our, our, our cover, CYA. This is our CYA clause, our cover our behind clause. 
if we do our screening and our placement properly, and properly, I believe, is defined by what our responsibilities are, then if the landlord suffers any loss or damages of not paying rental or the tenant vacating the premises early, we cannot be held responsible. But that has the, it has the opposite effect of saying, if we do not do our job properly, we have the potential of being held liable. So it's important that when we take on this responsibility, we do carry it out properly. I just want to go back to one other thing. I'm talking about where procurement ends and where management starts, what's included in procurement, what's not. I think this particular mandate gives you a very good idea of where the, where the variations are. If you look here at procurement mandate, we talked about what the general responsibilities are, the credit checks, the marketing, um, and those sorts of things, the show, the viewings. But you will see there are a lot of optional stuff that's written into the TPN one as an optional, as optional responsibilities. So this indicates to me that the market out there is not necessarily including these things as a standard procurement service. So negotiating the lease agreement, you could, for example, have an investor client that just wants you to source the tenant, vet them, hand over that information to them, and they will then conclude the lease agreement. Or they want the lease agreement concluded on their own on their own terms and condition. That's a possibility. Informing the tenant of all the rights and duties. In initiating and performing the incoming snag list or initial inspection. You see, that's a, it's dealt with as an optional in the general in the general um, procurement mandate, um, initiating performing the outgoing inspection and explaining to the tenant the tenant may be asked by the property practitioner to pay a portion of the rental. So it just shows you that there is a grey area between procurement and management generally in terms of the service offering. So it's important to say what do you offer. What is the value of your offering? And the, the two biggest values are that identification of the person, the vetting of the person, and the lease agreement. I see those as being the two huge value offerings that we offer. Okie dokie. So we start off at rental property marketing. Now, you guys are marketers par excellence because you are in sales. So we're not going to go into this in too much detail. One of the things I have noticed, one of the differences I have, however, noticed is that sometimes we need to we need to crunch the process into a shorter period of time because my turnaround time for a procurement is generally substantially shorter than my turnaround time for the sale of a property. So my communication, my education of the landlord is critical because the end result is the market, just, just as in sales, the market will determine what the market is willing to pay depending on what the options are and all sorts of other market factors that, that, that you are experts on. But our landlords don't always understand that. So I have two a, a few uh, slides that I would normally use to speak to the landlords about. The very first one has to do with the customer's journey. They see the ad, they inquire, they request a viewing and they ask for an application form. That's where our customers, our potential tenants, are generally they initiating those steps. But importantly, they are also filtering. They are also filtering because if they go to the internet and they say, I'm looking for a two-bedroom house in Fisher, where I happen to live, a two-bedroom house in Fisher, they're going to see more than what they can potentially go and have a look at. So they now filter those out for various reasons, which is why we lose them along the way. Because they, let's say they only have time to view two or three, or they choose the top two or three, or they choose the cheapest two or three, whatever it is. Um, they, they make a choice. They make a filtering. Okay, they filter us out. They then do a viewing and they put in an application. Then comes our filtering process. And I need to educate this to the landlord that my job here is to try and get this, this funnel as broad as possible, to catch as many fish as possible. And then we start checking them out, you know, for fishing, for example. Then we check out the size and make sure they're legal, those sorts of things. Exactly the same concept. I, I try and explain this in a short period of time, very concisely and simplistically to the landlord so that they are with me and I'm empowering them with the knowledge to take the right decision at the right time. So that's that's one of that's one of the concepts I would share with landlords. Another concept that I need landlords to understand is that the price bracket that we fall into is critical. 
because it filters the tenant's view. In the end, when the tenant goes to a property portal, they will say, I'm looking for a property in this range. And the portal will give them ranges to choose from. And most of us are lazy, so we're going to choose those ranges. We're not going to say 9,750 to 10,250. Most of us are not going to type that in. We're going to choose the 9,000 to 10,000. So if we are just over whatever the... And I'll give you an example. We had, we had a property once, which I think the landlord wanted something, and I, I'm probably going to have my figures wrong. But the landlord wanted something like, it was one of those landlords who said, I want 1780 in my pocket. I don't care what you do. To. So we added on our commission to that. And my recollection was that it came to whatever it was he wanted. Adding on our commission came to 20,200. So we advertised the property for 20,000. I know it was 2,000, 200 rand over, over a price bracket or into a new price bracket. And we had absolutely, absolutely no, no bites. We had, Nothing, nothing on that property. The agent didn't have a single inquiry and there was no viewment. And she spoke to me and she said, Sean, you know, this person is a friend of the business owner and blah, 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 and I'm stressed. And I said, okay, well, let's have a look at it. And then I went to the property portal. And sometimes it's as simplistic as this. We, 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 sometimes we forget how much we know. So it's as simplistic as explaining it to the landlord like this. So I said to her, look at that. The price bracket, if I recall correctly, was 19 to 20 and then 20 to 25. So we were just in that 20 to 25. So now when the tenant goes and searches 19 to 20, which is now, let's say, year, and we just over here, they don't see us. They don't see us. We're blanked out. But when they search 20 to 25, we're over here at the bottom. So now, visually, we're competing with all those 23s, 24s, 25s. So we don't look that attractive. And I said, are we going to have to consider that? She said, he won't drop. So I said to her, okay, well, let's have a chat with him because the bottom line is we're talking a difference of 200 rand here. And if he drops, we're dropping our commission at the same time because the bottom line is we're charging a percentage. She said, but he won't. I said, speak to him. Explain to him exactly the way that I've done it now. And she did. And he dropped and we had the property rented within a week. So price bandy is critical. It's critical that we, 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 we sit in a band where we look, we, 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 we compare favorably with the competition on the internet when the tenant is doing that filtered view. Remember, it's a very tiny band that they're looking at. It's a very tiny band. Um, so they are getting a very filtered view. Then the other discussion I talked to the landlord about is the affordability pyramid. This is a concept I've, I've named myself, my invention yeah which is really quite a simplistic fact. We give it a fancy name because they think then that somebody else developed it. But the higher we go, the less people there are. It's as simple as that. The higher we go, the less people there are. So if we combine the affordability pyramid with the price banding, because they're only seeing a filtered view, if we are here, then look at that little market we got. This is our potential market that we are that we are that we are marketing to. The potential. This is how big our net is. This is how big our net is. It's it's a very scarce fish season. But if we drop even slightly, and I've, I've dropped a lot now just to exaggerate this, but you see how bigger, how much bigger the market comes. So I use these tools to talk to landlords about this, where we talk about how important it is and how price sensitive. A, a, a change in price can make a huge difference in the size of our potential audience that we are marketing to. Sorry, I get a little bit excited about these things. Does that make sense? Levahang, yeah. Feel free to ask. Uh, hi, Sean. Uh, yes. No, this does make sense. My my question was more about the no, tools. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, let's just say there's a situation with the, the landlord wants to get a caretaker for one of her buildings. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, they can stay there for, that's her deal with the caretaker. They'll stay there for maybe three months. But they want the, the caretaker to have a full-on lease agreement and everything we should still do the full-on checks um, to fulfill our duty as the practitioner. Mm. Uh, but what happens if maybe they 
like with TPN says they're not a good payer or they're not a how do we assess that situation? Okay. Um I I would be doing at least at the very minimum a pre-screening, and I'm gonna show you a pre-screening report just now, uh, because you don't need anybody's permission to do that. Um, I would do a pre-screening, and if I had concerns, if I had concerns based on the pre-screening, I would be having a serious discussion with the landlord and explaining to them the risks. I believe that's our responsibility. I believe our responsibility is um, to explain to people what the risks are. If they don't want to listen to us, okay, that we can't necessarily change, because the reality is, I'm assuming that the caretaker is not going to be paying rent, that the, the, the flat they get is going to be a condition of their employment. Am I right? Yeah, I believe, but okay. it's conditional for only three months. So that's the tricky part that afterwards yeah. they should I mean, be paying as a normal the, tenant. It, oh, oh, so, okay, so it's only free for three months and then money's kicking in. Then, she, yeah, kicking then in. that caretaker should pay as a normal tenant. Okay, then, then, then you building. need to screen them. Then we definitely yeah. need to screen them as if they're a normal tenant. Um, and we need to have that serious discussion with the landlord. We need to talk to him about the potential risks he's opening himself up for by not wanting a screening, if that's what he's telling us to do. Um, I, I, I also had a free apartment as part of my last package. The lease agreement was conditional on my, my working for the company. And as soon as I resigned from the company, then the lease agreement then kicked into a, a, a payable lease agreement. The risk, of course, is uh, there's two risks here. The one risk is that they can't afford the rental um, mm. if we don't check them. We've got to know. We've got to know um, because it's not only about income. It's also about expenses and commitments, which we'll talk about when we get to credit checks if we, if we, when we get there soon. So, and the other risk, of course, is people just resigning and then not moving, mm. which which then becomes an eviction thing, and none of us want to go there. Mm. So, so let's 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 touch on pre-screening. Sure, okay. okay. now. If the landlord is insisting that the tenant stays on, we need to, from a FICA perspective, I guess, do checks on the tenant. But if the landlord um, is insisting on having that occupancy, well, then um, my my take would be. Um, sure, landlord, we'll do our basics, but do not hold us responsible. Uh, right. Should this go south, and 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 that's fine. But we, I think, um, because it's not that unusual for tenant for landlords to insist on on their friend or this person, um, or they act in a particular way, which means that they they then create risk for us as agents, and then now they're expecting performance for us as agents. Um, but it's, it's their decision. At that moment, we need to be very clear to landlords that for that we do not take responsibility for. I, I, I would certainly make sure that I've covered my behind by I, my recommendation would be to the landlord would be my, my genuine recommendation, which is also based on whether I want to, whether I'm prepared to manage this, this lease agreement or this particular tenancy. Um, depending on the situation, one can go various ways. I have had a situation where there was an application which we weren't comfortable with for various reasons, but the landlord insisted on going ahead. The landlord had the had the option to do that, but I then said to them that I would not be prepared to manage that lease going forward um, because I thought it was too risky, um, but that I was happy to do a procurement or convert the uh, mandate to a procurement, which they then decided to do. Um, so there's various ways of 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 dealing with that depending on the you know depending on the situation. But but you do you do need to make sure that you are absolved of any responsibilities and you've got to make sure that that it's documented. That's one thing I've learned. People have very short um memories, if I can put it that that way in a nice way. They they will generally forget what you said and then they you know who gets blamed. We're the filling in the sandwich. We always get blamed. So let's talk about pre-screening. Okay. If you have the ID of a person, you can get a pre-assessment or report as called from TPN. Okay. If you're one of their subscribers, um, you can get this. Now I normally advise, I find this a fantastic report. It's not a credit check. 
You do not need permission to get this. All you need is an ID number. Now, with the security situation, I've actually recommended, and I have clients to do this, um, that they will not make an appointment unless they've had a copy of the ID come in, and they explain that that is for security purposes. I mean, even from a business owner or a manager's perspective, I want to know that my people are safe. Once you've got that ID number for, six, I think it's 16 and 17, I can't remember how much this costs. You can get this information, okay? I can find out what the person's name is and whether they actually do correspond and do exist on the National proper Population Register and the Home Affairs National Information System. They real. They're not Tarbo Bester. Okay. Um, so that's 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 the one thing I can get. I can figure out if they're married or not. Not that I necessarily want to know that, but it might be useful if they want to go ahead. Um, and I get this summary. No detail, ladies and gentlemen, no detail, but I get this summary. This person, uh, this is an example TPN's given to me for training purposes, not a real person, I don't think. Uh, no, no, it can't be. They've given it to me. This person has judgments against them, which means they've, they've, they've had an order of court and they have defaults against them. I may, because of this, not think that it's in my best interest to spend time on, on viewings here. If, for example, this came up as does not exist on, 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 uh, on home affairs, then I've got serious worries. I'm not meeting this person. I don't know what their intentions are. Um, so it will it will tell you these things, and then you can you can see the photo. Well, you would have seen that there. You can see the photo of the person too. Um, so this is available. There's another there's another tool that they now have available, which I've never used. Okay, but it is available: a biometric screening which can be done. It actually forms part of the credit check, but you can actually go into a credit check and untick everything else and just, so, so I've been told by my, my source. And you can tick the biometric one, which does, it, it will give you the basic information, but it also sends a link to the tenant where they've got to take a photo of themselves. I think that one costs 16 rand 75 or something. Um, they take a photo of themselves. That photo gets compared through the software with the photo that's available at Home Affairs, and you get given a warning if something looks off. I think those are very, very useful tools. Very, very useful tools um, for avoiding potential. So coming back, Lebo, to your question, one may want to just do this sort of check on that person um, because in the end, you will have their ID number because they've had to provide that to you for the, the purposes of an application or whatever. And if you start seeing these sorts of things, then you might say to the, the landlord, we need to go a little bit further, or I've picked this up. I think that's where we show our value. We've got to be honest. I believe we've got to be incredibly honest. Part of the value we add is our experience, our gut feel that we develop with time. Um, the other thing that in terms of pre-screening, I would, I would, I wouldn't necessarily do a questionnaire, just do a, a quick chat over the telephone. I would make sure that people understand what my affordability criteria are, the basic ones. Basic ones, meaning if you want to rent for 10,000 Rand a month, we need to, we, you need to be able to prove to me that you get 30,000 Rand a month. That's, that's my basic criteria. We get into more information later on during the process. And Mr. and Mrs. Applicant, you do understand that when we sign the lease agreement, we are going to require the full amount of the deposit, which is so many rands payable on that date for the lease to become active. Because people don't always know these things. We forget how clever we are. We forget the knowledge that we have. We, 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 we need to, when we're dealing with potential landlords, tenants, all those sort of things, we need to sort of come back to basics. Come back to basics and think, what did I know before I was an agent? Um, so hopefully that helps you. Rental offers, it's not unusual for people to call you. Um, I must admit I'm a bit short-tempered when this happens. When people call me and say, oh, I'm calling about that property, will the landlord accept less? When they haven't even looked at the property. Okay? Um, or I see you want a 12-month lease for that property. Um, I only want to, to rent for six months. Or... Sometimes when you're doing a viewing, 
Um, somebody will say to you, oh, is the landlord going to fix that? Will the landlord paint that? And it's sort of landlord undertaking. So, so these sorts of matters, I tend to try and pack into my, my application vetting. So I would normally say to somebody, you know what? I don't know if the landlord will take less. We haven't had that discussion. However, I'm more than willing to talk to them about that if you send me in an application form. And there's a reason for this. If I just speak to the landlord now, I know nothing about you. It's, you know, they're not going to take me seriously. And so they may just, they may just brush it off. However, if I've got your basics, if I can see, you know, what sort of package the, the application is, what uh, I've got some basics about your situation, and I then speak to the landlord, and I say, look, I have a fantastic application here, but I tell them all the good things, but they want five, they, they're offering 500 rand less. If I'm saying to them, these are double income, no kids, both work for the government, almost guaranteed salaries, they earn four times the you know, net of the rent. I haven't confirmed that yet, but that's what they've shown me. Um, you know, on, on the face of it, that's true. Would you now consider? Then the landlord's going to, going to consider that. I'm, I'm, I'm empowering them with the information. I always say part of this whole process is I, I draw a picture. You know, in the old days, I'm probably date myself. Uh, we had that paint by number things. I don't have children, so I don't know if people still paint by numbers. But we had that paint by numbers thing. I'm filling in a picture for the landlord of these people. So when I want to say to the landlord, look, I've got this application, but, but they want a two-year lease, or but they want an 18-month lease, or but they only want a nine-month lease, but they want you to change the bath into a shower. Now, I've had those requests, not, not out of the world. Um the landlord will will think about it differently when I'm when I'm when I'm coloring in that in that picture a little bit more. So that's the first thing. The other reason I do this is because if I just call a landlord, they're not going to take me seriously, and also they might just there and then say yes and then change their mind later. And what I found is that people that call me for these questions normally don't go anywhere. Normally don't 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 follow through. So I'm not going to be calling my landlord left, right, and center about these matters. Um, that's how the way I deal with it. So I insist on an application and offers or any, any changes to, to the offered, any changes to the advertised, um, the advertised terms and conditions will be dealt with as part of the application process. Because let's be honest, if the, if the landlord's got three applicants, and on most factors, income, blah, 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 they, they're equal. And the one is happy to pay a thousand rand more than the others. Then that, I mean, it, it's to the landlord's benefit. It's to my benefit. It's to everybody's benefit. But I don't know that until I get the application in. You know, I might get the application into a pre-assessment and see that the, the person's got a judgment. Then I'm not, I'm not going to say the landlord will accept something where, I'm, I'm very, very cautious about these things. I think I've probably got over the 20 odd years, 20 odd years, yeah, 20 odd years that I've been doing this, 15 years almost exclusively in rentals. Um, I've been, I've burnt myself a few times. And so because of that, um, I, I'm a bit cautious. Okie dokie. Um, David, I, I saw your message. Thanks. So in terms of affordability, we're going to just go over some screening tips quickly. I've got, I've got a whole documented process. Okay. But essentially there's two steps to it. Firstly, I, I, the first step is that three times the rental amount that I talked about. The next step is when we get further down, if they pass that and they pass the employment checks, and they pass all of those things, then we do a credit check and let's look at an example of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a credit check. Because there's information in a credit check that I think is absolutely critical. I just want to find my example because this is this is where we show landlords. Now, when I pitch for business, when I'm, when I'm going to do my listing presentation, whatever you want to call it, my pitch, I have a kit with me. I have my toolbox with me. And in my toolbox, I have examples of things because I want to show landlords what it is I can get that they can't get, okay? 
I'm just trying to find my credit check example. Sorry, I just want to find that. I'm in the wrong place. Uh, because I think it's incredibly important for me to show this. And I have an example with a story that I always use. Let me just get into my listing kit. So these are the sort of things I have with me that we can talk to and show show real life examples. I show real life examples. So this is an, a redacted credit check, okay? And quick explanation of the story I will tell you is this gentleman applied for a rental through us. The monthly rental amount was seven thousand two hundred. His net amount that went into his bank account was twenty six thousand. Three times seven two is twenty one six more than satisfied those criteria. So, of course, he got through. Uh, and he went to the next step of the process. In the next step of the process, we drew this credit check. This is the information we get. Sorry, I'm probably showing you. Oops, I just want to make this thing bigger, not my other thing. Uh, there we are. So, when we went into the credit check, yes, he got verified. He had no judgment. He had nothing. But his monthly installments, his monthly commitments for his debt was 17,249. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very different picture because his disposable income that he can use for food and blah, 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 obviously you need to go and see what his deductions are, is now 27 minus 19, just to make it simple, becomes eight. Eight. Now we've got a different situation. In his, in, in his defense, there was a 5,000 rand bond um, included in that. He was going to rent his house out, but I cannot take rental income. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot attribute it fully because he was going to manage it himself. So for that reason, I simply couldn't do it. Um, so I, as I say, I've got a, a full rent pack and a whole process and my, my rental application training is two hours long. So we will get on to that. I think I've spoken already about fraudulent documents, bank statements, and pay slips. I spoke about how important it is to have both of them to verify against one another. Okay. But there's also now another service available through TP. And I, I just I just know their services because I work with them, where you can actually get a verified bank statement. Most of the banks in South Africa are signed up to it, um, and we are looking at a situation where the, essentially the bank statement gets get, gets sourced from the bank with the tenant's permission. I wouldn't, if, if I could get that, I would do it. I would do it. Okay, dokie, so standing out from the crowd when you pitch your service. And I think this is about the last thing I'm going to touch on, David, before we wrap up and deal with any questions. I talked about the tools that I have with me, and I think that's how I stand out from the crowd. I have examples with me of what, of what we do. So I, for example, would have an example of a inspection report with me. Oopsie, I probably shouldn't show that. I have an example of an inspection report with me. I show the landlord what we are going to be delivering. I have a real life example with me. Okay. I show them that. I also, I'm going to show you I, that credit check that I showed you just now. I have this with me. So we talk to the landlord about all the information that I get, the fact that I confirm with home affairs. This is how I... We do this, but so few people actually actually explain this to the landlords. I, I tell them about what the advantage is of dealing with, and I'm sorry, but the PPRA have not updated this. I, I have checked, updated this brochure yet. But what the, what the advantage is that they get of dealing with an estate agent in terms of fidelity fund and things like that, the cover that they get, the recourse that they get if anything goes wrong. I also have a copy of our standard lease terms and conditions with us where I would have highlighted certain things that I can talk to the landlord about what we do that other people don't do 
or don't include in their lease agreement. I'm standing out from the crowd, okay? Um, sorry, I just I have a look. I also have some important things highlighted in a copy of the rental unfair practice regulation sometimes um, with me. So I have I have these things on hand to show landlords real, real examples. It's like a model goes and says, I want to be a model. This is my, this is my portfolio. This is my portfolio. I have a, I have a portfolio as well. I have copies of my checklists with me. Let me just show you a quick example. Um, so when a landlord says to me, okay, but what do you do when you do rental applications? Okay. I say to them, I'll tell you exactly what I do. Um, and if I can find it for you quickly, here is the checklist that I work according to. So these are all the steps that I do when I'm doing a rental application. I, I, we don't have to go through the details, okay? But I have this available. I check that the application form, I check the supporting documentation. I have all these things. I, I think of them. I know that they are who they say they are, okay? Um, I do an initial affordability assessment, etc. I have this with me highlighted. Here's the questions I asked the employer, Mr. And Mrs. Landlord. That's when, that's when you stand out from that. Because a lot of people still, I'm, I'm afraid people go in and they'll be like, oh, I think you can get so much of the property. Should, can I take some photos? No, I show them what I do. I show them what I do. Okay, knowing your market, I think that generally you guys will be knowing your market when you go through. So, we need to be able to give an assessment of the current market rental. Now, this is difficult because we can't find recent rental market sales. So we need to keep an eye on the competition because in the end, we're talking that price band. We're talking that price band and how we compete to other people. Because in the end, the tenants, the tenant hasn't seen our house yet. They look at our pictures. They look at our pictures. We need to stay up to date with changes in the market. One of the numbers that I like to keep track of is a time to let. In other words, that's the time from the moment I list the property until I let it. I try and track that every month. So if a landlord says to me, or when I go and pitch, the other thing I have with me is my stats. Mr. Landlord, at the moment in this area, our time to let is about seven days. Our time to let is about two weeks. Make sure you ask the other agent what their time to let is. Because this is important to the landlord because they want income as soon as possible. Then lastly, ladies and gentlemen, we've spoken already, I believe, about this because I went into a bit more detail. The protection, the lease agreement that you are offering, you know, we see this as the norm of doing business. Our landlords have never often seen these things before. They don't understand the difference between buying the lease at pick and pay. To them, a lease is a lease. It is a huge value add-on. Lawyers charge thousands of rands to draw up a lease for a landlord. It's as simple as that. If you find out what your local lawyer charges, then you can say to them, the value of my services, the lease agreement, the credit check, all those sorts of things. And we are, we are, risk, we are potentially saving you or, or protecting you from this risk. Lastly, land, ladies and gentlemen, there are some add-ons or some upsells, okay, that you may want to include, that you may want to include. There is a service which I'm very comfortable recommending called Expello, which a landlord can subscribe to. Expello deals with evictions, but I never focus on that because nobody wants evictions in their life. But essentially for a monthly fee, Expello will intercede when there are breaches on the landlord's behalf. And especially if your landlord is going to be going this on their own now, because they're asking you to do this part, but then they're going to deal with it, okay? Um, I think that's a, a useful service to offer to them. And I can't go into too much detail about it now, but essentially what happens is when the letter of demand is sent out, Expello is CC'd in on that, and a week later they will find out whether it's been paid, and if not, they will then take any negotiations further with the tenant. 98%, their stats show that 98% of the cases they manage to negotiate their tenant out. When, the, when it's needed, without having to go to an eviction. And nobody went to an eviction. But there can be a huge protection, especially when the landlord doesn't have the expert knowledge. So that's something um, that you could offer your landlord. Um, it's normally 250 a month. If you do it through me, it's 220 a month. 
Um, the other thing is there is, there is an out, uh, there's a company called Preferential that I work with. Um, and I've, I've trained their staff and I work with them closely. Preferential offers a rental management service to landlords, but a, a, a totally in the sky one, no feet on the ground, no feet on the ground. Okay. Um, but there are agents that are clients of mine that that deal with the feet on the ground side, but they don't want the administration side. And then you can work through preferential. They'll do everything for you in the background. They'll do your, your vetting. They'll do all of those things. And you could then actually deal with managed rentals with only dealing with the feet on the ground side. So that's another option. So they would do your vetting for you. They would draw up the lease agreement for you. They would do your renewals for you. Um, all of those things they can offer in the background, um, which means that you could then essentially start building a pension fund in terms of a rental portfolio, but outsourcing the hard work. The, the nice thing about the preferential one is that they, they have different options. And one of them includes a rental guarantee for three months, I think it is. Um, so there are ways to package that and to essentially start building your own retirement fund by outsourcing that to people who are experts. And the only reason I will I, I will recommend them is because I know how they work um, and because there is somebody that I know in the industry who, who has a rental business, who outsourced absolutely everything to them uh, and is super, super happy. Um, so that's that's the reason I would. If you want to know any more, obviously I can't fit everything in to this presentation. If you want to know any more about those, I have created a form. If you go to rentalsphere.co.za front slash RFI, request for information, and then today's day, 2023 10 11 rentalsphere.coza front slash RFI 2023-1011. Um, there is a form there that you can let me know if you want to know more. And then depending depending on the amount of um, the amount of interest, we may be able to um, arrange a, a um, an info session with those two service providers. Um, I work closely with them and I, I only recommend people that I work closely with. Um, so our FI 2023-10-11. And that should then take us, oopsie. I'm going to have to get back to you on this. I thought it was working. Um, I'll, I'll figure that out. And if you are interested in that, feel free to pop me a WhatsApp. Let me do it that way. Because clearly something's wrong here. Uh, David, that wraps up what I planned to cover. I'm not sure what so that's your point. Um, I think I think uh, you've done. I mean, there is there is so much to cover and quite a lot of detail to cover. So I think, um, please, guys, if I can recommend that you that you subscribe to to Sean's um, emails, um, if you can just do that. He does cover. Um, he does do a independent training. And quite a lot of courses. He's got resources on his website, and quite a lot of additional one-off courses, which are fairly inex quite inexpensive, actually, and massively good value for money, uh, which delves into details of what of much of what he's done today. Uh, so really, to be um, be accessible to that resource, I do think that Sean is a critical resource in our industry uh, to provide this kind of level of training, and of course. Um, uh, just additionally, mice, I'm obviously always available for a quick phone call or something. I'm sure um, if, if you mentioned to Sean that you that you link to myself, if you give Sean a, a 30 second phone call, he can probably give you a quick question uh, answer to that. Um, yeah. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give my cell phone number. Um, to yes. um, so I can I recommend that? Um, yeah, so just to please do take the reason. Us as agents, guys, part of what we do is that we need to have access to our conveyancing attorney for a quick phone call, quick technical question. We need access to a rental expert for a quick question. If it's not part of our uh, brand's team, I know with EXP, there's there's a lot of resources. Uh, so maybe some of you have with Remax, I'm sure the resources, but, but on a rental specialization perspective, have uh, one or two people in your database that you can give a quick phone call. A lot of our value is us not necessarily being the expert at absolutely everything, but um, having access to experts who 
Um, I mean, the landlord or the, the seller at the end of the day doesn't really care who he gets the information from, or he doesn't care where we get the information from, they just need the information. Um, okay, cool. Please, are there any questions, um, any comments or questions on the whole gambit of what Sean has uh, gone through today? Please feel free, the, the floor is open for any questions, please. While we're waiting for that, David, I have popped a link to that form. I fixed it. I found it. Um, I've, I've popped a link to that form. Oh, I sent it to you directly, silly me. Um, sorry, I'll send it to everybody. If some if people want to know more about the outsourcing service so they can build a retirement fund, and I'm also sharing my cell phone number there, you're welcome to pop me a message at any point in time. Um, people normally will pop me a WhatsApp or send me a voice note. Um, and then we will arrange a time to chat. I'm available. If Look, in this business, you've never seen everything. Um, and I also have access to rental property specialist lawyers um, that I can consult if I have anything. Done. And the thing is that, um, uh, Sean, I've been in this industry for uh, pretty much as long as you have. I mean, since actually I bought my first property in 1999, it was a complete stuff up. But anyway, uh, I mean, I've, as, as, as we all know, I've written the book on rental management. I'm still learning something every day. So let's not pretend that we have to know all the answers. Also, five different attorneys may give you five different opinions. Um, yeah. So you've got to take the legal perspective together with the practical um, outlook and experience. And my um, and Sean, uh, maybe you have a similar filter. I always say, what is ethical and what is going to pass at the rental housing tribunal? If I answer those two questions, especially around the rental housing tribunal, um, then I can have a clear conscience. We as Chorus Property Group, and we've managed this for twenty years, thousands of properties. Um, if if the landlord hasn't overridden us, but if we have made a decision. Um, and then have taken been taken to the rental housing tribunal. I don't think we've ever lost a case um, because if you're just fair and reasonable um, and you do the right thing at the moment, then typically you're, you're, you're going to be fine. Um, but do use those resources uh, around us to make sure that you are making that right decision at the right time. We are in the people. One thing I want to add, Sean, the rental management business, also the rental procurement business is very much a people business. Like we, all of us in property, uh, we're in the people business. So let's treat each other with respect, treat tenants with respect, be firm, but fair, and then we should get along just fine. Um, I know the firmness is is a super important factor that we have mentioned today. Okay, go. Yeah, good I, guys. I used to say one of the carry on. one of the skills is learning to say no. Yeah. Um, because more often than not, people get into problems when they when they decide to say yes without thinking. But Sean, it's, but, it's all, but then we couch it in the way which is beneficial for to, to the tenant or the landlord. Mr. Landlord or Mr. Landlord, um, I'm doing this for your good. I've learned that um, I'm pushing back on this particular point because in my experience, in your good, it's going to be in your best interest to do for, for us to make this decision. And that often, uh, and then also we need to protect our interests. Uh, we, we really need to protect our own interests as, um, as as agents, not only from a legal perspective, which I think is slightly less important, but more from our own time perspective. If we don't protect our time, we are going to be drawn into a whole lot of things that we are, have not signed up for. And in this market, uh, management of rentals and or getting sucked into the management if we're not charging for it is something that you need to be very strict on up front. Uh, because yes. otherwise you, you're going to you on a hiding for nothing on using a lot of your time on stuff which is not is not paying you, uh, and then it becomes a huge opportunity cost for you not making sales which you need to be making sales or for, with. Our biggest challenge in the rental management business is is clarifying what the boundaries are in our services, um, and and this is increasingly important with our margins being tighter. And mm -hmm. but from a sales agent perspective, you need to be tight so that you can protect your time, so you can continue to make money uh, and not be taken away from your sales business. Okay, guys, um, what quick questions? And uh, let's shout it out, uh, put, put up a hand or otherwise just um, unmute yourself and shout out or otherwise put something in the in the chat box, please. Yeah, they, uh, feel free. Any Temba. Temba, go ahead. Go ahead, Temba. If you can unmute okay, yourself. Okay, morning, morning, everyone again. Morning. Uh, Sean is Temba. Uh, yes. I'm David Menti. Uh, I would like to pose a question regarding the Expello bridge management. 
yes. if maybe you need some assistance on that regard, how do you get hold of them? And uh, what kind of assistance are they doing? And then in short, in short, uh, I'm doing sales under David. And then I've got my own small portfolio that I'm running. So I'm doing my little bit rental management. And then I'll also like to grow uh, in that uh, space as well in the near future and also grow my, my sales. So yeah, I, I've liked this issue of the landlord protection regarding the, split, the expert law of what is their uh, assistance in terms of the bridge, uh, in terms of management. Okay. Um, Timba, essentially what it is, is a mo- it's a monthly joining fee, let's call it that, mo- a monthly subscription. It's not an insurance product. I'm not allowed to call it an insurance product. There's laws around that. But people pay a monthly subscription. Normally it's $250 a month. Through me, you get a discount to $220 a month. And essentially it's 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 almost like an insurance because if anything goes wrong and there's a breach, then the first step would normally be a warning. The second step would to do a breach notice or what we call a letter of demand. Um, if if the landlord or yourself is a, a tenant, uh, if your landlord is a an expello client, you CC expello on the letter of demand. They would letter of demand is normally twenty business days. After seven days, they will contact you and find out if the breach has been rectified. If not, they will then contact the tenant and they will then explain to the tenant how important it is that this breach gets rectified. They will they have a little bit of muscle in terms of not not muscle in a bad way. I can't think of another word while I'm sitting on behind. Um, they have a little bit of uh, a clout. Let's call it clout muscle. Sorry, bad words. Um, in terms of saying to the, listen, yeah, this landlord has entrusted us to look after this. And the best solution is going to be for us to negotiate you out of the property. If, we, if we're in this situation, if you can't afford it, they've arranged moving vans for people at their cost. They've arranged, uh, found alternative accommodation for people that's cheaper, anything to get the people out of the property because it's an expert, different from lawyers. They have a panel of lawyers, but if it goes to eviction, if it goes to lawyers, then, then Expello pays for it. Okay, they pay for the full eviction cost. So they're trying to avoid that. So 98% of the time, they will negotiate a a satisfactory um, conclusion to that. They will negotiate the tenant out, and that will normally be in four to six weeks. Um, And only the 2% would go further than that. And to me, that's the reason that I support them, um, is because they don't focus on making the money out of the eviction. They focus on getting the property back, which means my landlord can get income back. So that it's basically an income. Uh, I mean, a few of our landlords are now using the service. It's a protection on on eviction costs. That's the very simple, simple language. Eviction yeah. nowadays, and we're experiencing it. A number of our landlords that we've inherited, not our tenants that we place, but the the, the evictions that we typically are doing is um, tenants that we've inherited, and it's become a major issue. The courts are super unfriendly at the moment. And if Expello for two hundred fifty rand or two hundred twenty rand a month want to carry that cost, well then I'll gladly pay it. Um, so yeah. So, so Temba, if you want to know more about that, I did put the link to 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 further inquiries. If you want and have any inquiries about either that or the outsourced back office or rental admin service, and that includes the rental guarantees. Okay, depending on which tier you want to opt for, but you're welcome to go to that link and pop your info in and tell me which service you want to know about, and then I can arrange a follow up, or I can get Elise from Expello or somebody from Preferential to contact you directly. So um, at least also has uh, monthly uh, webinars. To be honest, yeah. a little bit long sometimes, but otherwise um, they're very useful. And um, she's uh, she's a wonderful lady. And but when you deal, if you do ever deal with her, make sure that you that you have said that you got the details through Sean. Yeah. Um, but I know Elise very well as well, and she's very well known in the industry. Um, she's the owner and founder of of um, of Expello. Just um, Sean, if my if I may add my bit on preferential, they're mm-hmm. basically a, a basically a tech rental business. That provides yes. a back end system, uh, billings and collections. So they collect the rent on behalf of the landlord and then they pay over lesser fee to the landlord, like a rental agent, but they're not really a rental agent because they don't carry they don't do anything on the ground practically yeah. or deal with tenant issues and all that kind of stuff. So uh, but from an administrative perspective, uh, for an agent on the ground who wants to place a tenant and then maybe be available to do a maintenance or a coordination or something, uh, preferential is a great little product to use. Um 
I wish I thought of it myself, to be honest. But um, yeah, so from an independent agent perspective, just to keep your, and what Sean was saying from a strategic perspective as agents, it's almost like those those tenant placements are kept in your name uh, because preferential don't do uh, don't do sales uh, at all, yes. um, and then you you're building up a a potential um, rent uh, sales book. Bear in mind, uh, a lot of the big brands, let's say Pam Golding, have built up their rental book for one reason only, and that's for the sales this the sales value thereafter. And we as Chorus Property Group, are mainly in Cape Town on our portfolio, but but we've sold I don't know I don't know what percentage, maybe five or ten percent of the properties we manage. Um, then come on sale every year or so. And that is a beautiful uh, sales income um, uh, perspective. And, and, and some of and as I said, it's good from a strategic perspective uh, to, to keep in touch with the landlords um, so that you get their, their, rent, their, their sales. Um, and that's, that's very valuable in the, in the long term. Um, just, just to um, expand a little bit, David, preferential can also deal with the maintenance issues. Uh, as part of their right. service offering, um, they've got a thing called TOD, which is something about a uh, TOD. Okay, okay, right. no, okay, so they obviously um, yeah, so so it can be done through TOD as well, which means that it's only that it's only where somebody physically has to go somewhere that you need an agent on the ground that the agent would be involved. But essentially, to a large extent, the ongoing management, the collections, and and their fees include expeller, and they include if if you go to the, the higher oh, tier. It's overall a great little package to have, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, in essence, they're a bit of a competitor. But um, I have used, uh, we have linked with them in the past, and I've got lots of kudos for them. Yeah. Um, I've got especially, three... um, you know, in outlying areas when there's not a lot of management. I mean, Chorus can do a bit of management for some of the placements, and but some of us on on this call are not in the in our team. Um, and um, I want to respect that to say, well, for you guys who don't have an in-house management team, uh, a preferential product is is awesome. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any what other questions, um, comments, guys? Surely there must be some questions. Uh. Yeah, can I ask? So, does Expello does it help you immediately? Because, um, like with the services to, uh, I, I think I, my my uncle has an issue with a, a current tenant, um, who is non-paying. So, is he liable to send the letter of demand and then, or does Expello do that once you procure the services? Okay, you you need to be you need to be a client because otherwise you will understand from a business perspective everybody will problems yeah. will want to pay two hundred and fifty rand and get an eviction it doesn't work that way, um, but I know that sometimes they have helped existing clients but it's a much higher fee, um, but yeah um, if it's an existing tenant I think they want a four four month statement and then when they'll decide to take on that tenant. Um, if it's a new tenant, as long as they've approved the agency, then they're happy to do it. So um, that's probably going to... What area is your husband, uh, your, your uncle? Sorry. Sorry, you, you muted yourself, Lebo. Awesome. Well, it's in the north of Johannesburg. Okay. Um, so the simple answer, is the, the, the simple answer there was um, that existing tenant, unfortunately, Lebo's uncle is going to have to sort that out typically himself. Himself. Yeah. Um, but it's something but I think I want to recommend for him. But, if but going to, forward, that for new tenants yeah. placed, um, I would recommend uh, something like um, yes. like an expeller. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what other questions, guys? Please, uh, please feel free to um to to keep keep going. Um. Everything from. Uh, how do we deal with landlords to marketing the property to then play, um, doing the tenant screening to then doing the movement inspection just on the one port part Sean when it comes to the property handover there's a bit of a gray area if I may just touch on that mm -hmm. when it comes to the inspection um, often with the inspection there's then maintenance that needs to be happening or this needs to be sorted out or that um, be very clear with the landlord as to where your service ends Sean and, and had kind of mentioned that the movement inspection at the tenant keys handover. I would typically say that me as an agent, I would do this is my opinion, Sean, is to do a keys handover with the tenant and do the movement inspection with the tenant. So you know, I've done the inspection, then I walk through the property with the tenant just to make sure we're on the same page. And then I'll do a summary report to the landlord as to this is what I've done. And in my in our view as an agent, these things need to be attended to and then handed over or to the agent. 
But then you're going to be, um, if you're not clear with that and you do a decent handover to the landlord, you're going to be pulled into things like, oh, you need to sort out access, you need to arrange this contract, et cetera. Um, if that is the case, well, then make sure you charge separately for that. Yes. Um, be, you, you're quite right, David. It, 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 there are no rules around where it ends and where it doesn't. Make sure that you know where your service offering ends. Make sure your landlord understands that so you don't you don't have any conflict there. And make sure you don't overstep that mark. And I'm not saying that in a nasty way. But as soon as you open that gate, guys, you 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 can be or these things are time consuming. Make sure that you can say, look, I can do maintenance, but there's an extra 10% to be charged on top of that or something like that. Make sure you get compensated. David was quite right. Rentals can chow up your time. It can chew up your time if you don't manage it. Um, and if you are going to be spending time, you want to be compensated. And, and, and it's, it's what you call service creep. I mean, if I go to a restaurant and I order a liquor steak, and then and then um, and and then um, and I pay for the steak and a glass of red wine, but then I get a glass of coke, and then at the end I get an extra piece of dessert. I mean, the restaurant's going to say, "But hang on, you didn't, um, you didn't, you're not paying for that dessert and that coke." So it's no different when you do these services, but but I think where agents often fall down is is that they're not closing the loop off correctly. In, they're actually erring on the side of not close, not doing enough on closing it off. In other words, they hand over keys and that's it, um, as opposed to um, and and especially the the move in inspection they're not doing correctly. So do the move in inspection correctly and then finish off there, but then don't go over that mark. When it comes to the moving inspection, guys, um, those not on our team, please be in touch with me uh, or Sean. Uh, but I mean, I've, I've got a, we've got a paper-based uh, inspection that you can use, which is perfectly acceptable. Then take set, uh, photographs. But um, using a red rabbit system is, uh, I would suggest, is is an incredibly professional way and relatively cost-effective way of doing your your inspections. Um, so yeah, those are the tools, the two main tools. Go red rabbit where you can very cost effective and very professional, but in lieu of not not knowing that technology or it's too much effort, we'll then have at least a paper-based inspection form. And I'm quite willing to share that uh, to, uh, to, to, you know, to those in the industry if, if required. But make sure you do it guys, please. Make sure you do that inspection. Um, yeah, and then when you do the inspection, just once again, also going down that rabbit trail, be very clear with the, tenant that I'm, I'm recording these items, not necessarily that the work is going to be done, but to protect your interest on the move out. Because some tenants, um, for every single snag that you've you've uh, recorded, they're expecting that you're going to be uh, rectifying it. Very, very important to make that clear. Um, it, people are not renting a perfect property. In essence, they're renting a, a suitable property that was in the condition they viewed it normally it were normally in the condition they viewed it. Um, the Rental Housing Act specifically says that the inspection is done to record defects, to protect, it doesn't say on these words, this is my plain English, um, I, either for the landlord to take care of or for it to be noted. It's not necessarily got to be fixed. Yeah, cool. Sean, we're pretty much done. We've got one minute left. Um, mm -hmm. In not being there too many questions, I'm going to just do what I've done is I've done, I've done all the names in here. I see okay. a couple of folks have left, so that's their loss. Um, and just so I can be um, neutral, is this okay? Is this, is this, does this come under um, an auditing? I'm going to take well, out... I'm, I'm not sure about the use of Pyrex, but I'm sure we can deal with it. No, but you can't see the names there. You can't see the name. Okay. And <laughs> I've got, can you see it there, is Bassani. So Bassani, please can you do me a favor? Can you send me um, your address, please? You got my details, Bassani. We have you have been in touch. Send me your address, and then I will send you a copy of my book. How about that? Congratulations! Oh, great, thank you. Um, so, if anybody has, guys, any um, we we did say we would have a we would have a a, a, a sharp twelve o'clock finish. Um, I just want to thank every one of you for joining. I really appreciate your time and investment in this. I'm hoping that it has been useful. Um, but thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. And secondly, I want to thank Sean for investing your time in us. Sean has been incredible. Thank you so much. It's, um, it met my expectations. It blew away my expectations. And uh, it's been incredible. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. If anybody has any questions, you know how to get hold of me. Yep. 
Oh, thanks, thanks, David. All the very best. Keep well. Hey? Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.